Okay, good morning, good afternoon. Let's, uh, let's dive into this. So I would like to start with uh, mentioning our Philips ambition. It is to empower people to live a healthier life and to prevent the need of hospital care and support the transition out of hospital after clinical treatments and preferably keep patients out as well. So as an experienced lead, I enjoy designing an experience that truly enables users to lead a healthier life. I'm Nicole de Klein, and I'm going to tell you a bit about our journey to make this happen. I'm joined today by Eva Deckers, and unfortunately, Sander Bogers, part of our core team, can't join today. So today I'd like to talk about three things. How data can play a key role in a design process. How we build a system that grows with the user and how we gather feedback on the system in the field. So let's hear first from Eva Deckers how and why data needs to play a key role in the design projects. Over to Eva. Yes, thank you, Nicole, and also a warm welcome to everyone uh, joining us from uh, different places in the world. As Nicole said, I am the design director for Data Enabled Design, and I think with this team and the broader data design team, UX research, service design, uh, UX design, we are really pushing for what design can do, bringing data and AI into an inherent part of our design pr process. And what I would like to share with you as a kind of kickoff of our presentation that Nicole will take you through is that we have to really think about if we want to be truly meaningful to our um, users, to people, is that we have to think about what is the true meaning of data. And data can really reveal care needs for individual in a certain specific area and from there also beyond. And let me tell you a little bit about this with some anecdotes that are actual stories from our studies. So in one of our studies that was leading to the design of taking care of yourself, we saw, for example, um, a lady who was actually interested in cleaning her skin. So she was uh, active with our um, Visipure uh, skin cleaning device. Um, and when talking about that, we were looking into the, or the system was looking into the data of uh, her skin cleaning, but also her routine with uh, toothbrushing and so forth. And from that, we actually saw that she was actually, and she herself saw that she was sleeping, she was only brushing at one o'clock at night and then again at six o'clock in the morning, actually showing she might need a little bit more sleep. And that was not immediately working for her. So we were helping her with our uh, uh, skin uh, cleaning advice to fight some tired uh, eyes. On another occasion, so this is really about taking care of yourself in your daily routine, but it hinges on could we actually help someone to get better sleep? In another occasion, we saw a male participant actually getting forming quite erratic behaviors of both uh, brushing his teeth and shaving um, to the middle of the night, to the middle of uh, and to the middle of the day. And we actually turned out that this participant was suffering from a burnout. So and here you see that it's these personal stories that could really, if we could really help people on these personal needs, we could make a difference and maybe also prevent them from developing more severe conditions. So we also like to think about that in that way in our solution and have these different elements part of the solution, thinking about what motivates you, how can we bring self-awareness? Can you really understand, um, yeah, where, um, what could be the ways, like the, the example of brushing your teeth at different moments of the day that show that you are not sleeping that much, but also think about what motivates you. You want to get most effective sleep or do you want to get longer sleep? How much sleep do you actually need as a person? It's also about making you smile, getting you through the day, preparing for the special moment when you are about to go to a wedding, it inspires you to change your behavior or do something differently and make yourself feel the best uh, version of yourself. And very importantly, we want to go to the point that you also feel looked after, after, that with this taking care of yourself system, you have this body, you have this support that helps you in small things, taking care of yourself, but also the bigger questions that we all run into if it comes to our health. And that's why we really 
aim at truly understanding what matters to whom in which in, uh, situation. So with, through our devices and through the interaction with our system, we have an understanding of how the user behaves. And if we know this, we can also want to know with more subjective uh, qualities, like why does the user behave like this? And if that is the type of data, so both quantitative and qualitative, if we bring that together, we can point at the moments that we can deliver care when it matters and also how it matters. So this is kind of the starting point. What is the value of data? Always considering what is the personal benefit for our users, for people. So let's have a look at how we then decide to taking care of yourself system. So please, Nicole, take us through this uh, story. Okay. Thank you, Eva. So why did we see the need to build a system that grows with the user? We first need then to understand that when you want to take good care of yourself or your loved one, this means something different for everyone. For one person, it could mean sleeping well, eating nutritious food, breathing fresh air, or for another person, it could be around looking good and healthy. Actually, it could also mean something different for one individual, depending on the day, season or life phase you're in. And there's always reasons why living a healthy life is not so easy. To be honest, I never brush better in the weeks before I'm going to the dentist. But do I keep up with it afterwards? And every time I step onto a scale, I promise I'm going to go for weekly runs. So we all need small nudges to keep taking good care of ourselves as our needs keep changing. And to facilitate this, we need to think in non-linear journeys, journeys that aren't predictable. So it's not like going to a restaurant, which generally everyone follows similar steps. You search for the restaurant, you book it, you sit down, you order, you decide what to eat, you order, you eat, pay and leave. It's more similar to a theme park. We all enter through the same entrance, but our paths differ from person to person. You can spend all day in one ride, whereas others go all around this park to explore the rides there are. So we need a new way of caring that puts these evolving needs in the center and supports every unique journey. As Eva already said, we call this caring when it matters, having a meaningful dialogue at the right moment. We do this by aiming to understand the current needs of a user and capture that in a care profile and trigger actionable care plans to enable outcomes and understand the new needs of the user all in a continuous loop. So how is this care profile influence? Let's take a look at a real example of our study. This is the onboarding profile and it is informed by what we discover from onboarding questionnaire. Three weeks later, it looks like this. So again, these were the things we figured out from onboarding questionnaires. But after that, the frequency of the toothbrush used, the frequency of which the Visapure was used and the type of brush head that was used on it, the skin assessment values. Um, it's both influenced by data from using devices and the services, as well as subjective input through conversational UI. So that means that the article she's reading or he or she is reading and self-reported motivation is also influencing this profile. Then what are care plans? So care plans are built up of smaller modules that each provide their own value, and they can be placed in any order that is relevant to the user needs to make up a full program. So every module aims to achieve a different goal, such as the models you see here, articles to improve the awareness on a topic, or life coaching to improve your performance, or a questionnaire to probe on some context. Those are examples of the modules we have created. But still, I hear you uh, thinking this still looks like a system on paper. So how did we gather feedback from the people in the field on this system? We have actually done multiple pilots to optimize the system during our design process. And participants in these pilots are given different devices, such as toothbrushes, skin sensors or shavers as a first entry into the system. The study that I'm going to talk about now was a study with 20 participants over eight weeks, and they had uh, a number of devices. Open trackers were also given as it, as it allows us to uh, gather data on a, from the user that is on a topic that they are interested in themselves. We also have a channel to talk with our participants, which is an app and a researcher dashboard. And as it was important for us to increase the sense of dialogue instead of just a single directional communication line, 
we use the Flow AI tool to create the personal programs in a conversational UI style. So really conversations that you could uh, have like in WhatsApp. We had 571 pre-scripted conversations, uh, trees created at the start of this pilot and more during the study when we went live. At the back end, we could see a full overview of the data collected by the devices, which you see here on the left. It's raw data, but also gathered insights on the data. And there was an extensive trigger dashboard in which we created the logic for the automatically activated modules that I've showed you earlier. So when new topics or questionnaires were introduced. And they, they were introduced based on interest levels in the care profile, but very often in combination with other requirements, like whether it's evening or Sunday, or it's a high pollen day today. The wizard team could monitor all in-app conversations, including how it changed the care profile score, which is what you see here. So you see the points that are uh, added or distracted from the care profile on the different uh, topics. And we used it to monitor whether the triggers were meaningful or whether another intervention was needed. Now, let me explain that a little bit better with this example. One of our experience cases. So participant X start using the brushing coach with his toothbrush. And after one and a half week, the data shows that there are no morning brushing sessions logged. So the trigger that senses there's no regular brushing routine was activated and explained why it's important to brush regularly and if he wanted to see a brushing report. That was confirmed, so we sent the system sent a report and it's obviously in this report that there's no morning brushing sessions logged. The system then asked if he would be interested to set reminders for brushing in the morning and the reply was no thanks. Yet we did see two morning brushing sessions happening after this uh, first reminder was sent. So this would indicate for us wizards an opportunity to find another hook and dig deeper in the true unmet need. We wondered if the benefit of a great smile would be hooking to motivate and change. As we had some conversations prepared on the impact of nutrition, such as teeth, stains and breath, we triggered that. This resonated and breath control seems to be a topic of interest. Some inspirational content was given on how a food impacts the breath and uh, after a few days, we introduced the job of cleaning the tongue. It was mentioned alongside with the option to order a tongue cleaning accessory. And as he started to use the accessory, we noticed that it wasn't always using it in the morning and very often actually after brushing instead of before. So the conversation could continue on this topic. This all in the end led to this brushing behavior, which you see here on the screen, of which the user himself mentioned that he really liked the coaching feedback he got. So next to uncovering the care needs, the user could also proactively start care plans himself by asking a question. There could be questions around teeth grinding, hair loss during pregnancy, or even sunburn. sunburn. And as these examples show, the questions are very diverse, but are all personal, meaningful uh, needs to the study participant. After eight weeks, uh, when the study ended, we visited our users in their homes and more unmet needs emerged. Because to be honest, bathrooms don't look picture perfect. People live much smaller than you think or actually reveal to you that their weekend hobby is creating hairstyles, which we didn't capture in the care profile. Yet, most of our users want to keep using the system and small and big impacts were made. Like this user, uh, which I talked about in the brushing example, that really appreciated the brushing guidance even at his age. Or the user who thought the system was like a savior there when you want to ask all your health questions. So I want to leave you with three lessons learned. That data is a tool to reveal care needs and empowers healthy living. That systems that empower healthy living should facilitate non-linear journeys. And that we need to continuously test systems in the field as things are never as you thought on paper. So this was what we wanted to tell today and we are opening up for questions and answers at this moment. Thank you so much, Eva and Nicole, for sharing this amazing concept with us. It's really super interesting to get a peek behind the scenes, I think, uh, of a, a really data driven project. Um, and also very good to see the developments in the space of healthy living, prevention and home care. So 
My name is Colette Forma. I will be uh, moderating the Q&A session with Ava and Nicole. I'm sure there will be enough questions in the audience, so if you feel like asking something about this uh, presentation, just drop your question into the Q&A panel and we'll uh, hope to answer as many as possible in the time uh, we have. Just to, to kick it off, Eva, um, how does taking care of yourself relate to other devices like Apple Health and what makes it unique? So what makes it unique is the combination of, on the one hand, using the data to understand what you are doing is also uh, deep, deeping, uh, deep diving deeper into why you are doing it. And we really believe that these are essential if you really want to support people in making choices or changes um, in relation to their health. We all know that you know, for some of us, it might work to get a presentation of your own personal data, but for many of us, it is far more effective if it has some more depth in you know, having a conversation on why and then choosing the right intervention. And that is, I think, the second difference is with a system like this, we can really move into support on various fields. And that, I think, also is from the figures perspective, what we can really do with our combined portfolio for our consumers and personal health, as well as for patients and professional staff at hospitals on the other side. We can carry this breadth of um, deep and rich content, information, care programs that is supported also from the more medical side, from the healthcare point of view. Thank you very much for clarifying that. Nicole, in one of the videos you, and also in this presentation, you spoke about the fact that this project really combined theory with practice. So the wizards, for example, that monitor how someone connects to the content you had sent and even visiting consumers in their homes uh, during the pilot. Can you expand on what this brought to the project team and what you learned, how it helped you taking next steps? Yeah, so maybe it's even good to start it. How did we uh, start to study as wizards? Uh, so when participants were uh, recruited to participate in the study, they were given the devices and installed the app by someone else than the wizards. So we as wizards would never have seen these uh, people uh, before, before we started interacting with them behind the scenes, uh, which is actually also how the system would, would start normally. They would also only know your name and no, don't know how you look like or get any context from that. Um, and then Obviously, when we visited their homes, we already had built quite an intimate relationship with these people, knowing all their needs. Um, and then you finally see a face with that name and that person and you see a house and then you really, um, really understand whether you did, did make the right uh, suggestions for them to, uh, to uncover care needs. Or you found out indeed like this uh, lady that has this bathroom with lots of devices and a passion for creating hairstyles that actually this is what we could have helped her also on creating hairstyles with less damage. Mm -hmm. It's in her passion. Um, so it really helped the team to um, at the end as wizards also see the people in real life and then anticipate future uh, care needs that could be triggered yeah, the system again. You discover and maybe, uh, maybe I could add to that question or to that answer. Um, so in this uh, project, actually, in our uh, data-enabled uh, design team and the approach we uh, we develop, we always see an intimate relation between advancing the design discipline and capability and skills together with really also pushing, um, in this case, um, how could we deliver care in the best way possible, also in a business context, to our users. Um, and over time, this is actually um, um, a, a nice example of how we we started with more with smaller projects. We once started with advancing or accelerating on a single connected product in uh, actually childcare uh, around modern childcare around a connected baby model. We started learning about how could we use data into the design process, and from there we started to make steps, making the ecosystem bigger, having more devices, having more content into what Nicole has been explaining thinking and coming to the point that we have to think and how can we facilitate these multi-dimensional journeys, non-linear journeys in which basically anything could happen. 
And that is very important because anything can happen in anyone's life. Yes, there will be similarities, but the thing that matters most to you is maybe that thing that makes you unique. Mm -hmm. And how, if we can unravel that, we can actually accelerate in delivering more personalized and precise medicine for more of us, starting in the healthy, uh, healthy living and prevention area. So this is something that we develop in house and where we go and where you especially see here, we move from first research and innovation projects into larger scale studies and pilots as Nicole showed into now actually developing this further um, directly for our consumers. Really, really interesting to hear. Thanks for that. Um, I, I'm imagining people might have questions around the ethical side, so data security and all related matters. Um, can one of you elaborate on that? Yes, I can. Uh, I can give this a, a start. Um, actually, this is something when we develop this data-enabled design, as I just talked about. This is one of the skills that as a design organization, and that goes for the design community at large, we actually have to develop. Um, and this is actually in an area um, where we deal with personal health and we are not per se at the starting point dealing with very severe conditions or acute care settings. But we are moving this practice also into the really the patient's uh, uh, life and also into the clinical professional. Clinic, uh, clinical professional uh, area. And then it's very, very important that we do it right within all the privacy regulations and ethical considerations. So we really invest in this as a true design skill. Um, and actually in an earlier conversation that we had with maybe some of you earlier on core care, you see that we really pushed and had our first design driven clinical study, uh, really valuing experience and making personalized care possible. So also for this uh, taking care of yourself process at all stages, we follow the highest standards that we are not looking to get your data. We are looking to use it to bring a true benefit to our user um, within all the regulations and boundaries that are uh, uh, there and also finding out how we best deal with that. And the most important lesson is, is that the ethical conversation is not something you just do at home with, you know, at our design uh, or within Philips. It is actually something you co-create with the people you design for. Because in this world where data uh, becomes more available, where things get more connected, we have to shape that together and see how we could use that to the true benefit of our, of our users, of people. Thank you, Ava. Yes. Maybe connected to this, um, there is a question in the audience. If we have thought about the ethical aspect of selling extra products, like you, you mentioned, uh, this way. Yes, so I can, um, yeah, good. I can take that one. Yeah, so it's um, first of all, indeed, we're not trying to sell products that are not meaningful to a user. So we're really trying to provide a benefit with our products to the user. Let me also explain the example of tongue cleaning a little bit further. So we didn't probe on buying a tongue cleaning accessory initially. We just introduced the topic of tongue cleaning because bad breath was a, a field of interest. And we explained how you could clean your tongue with other, um, other, other manual uh, solutions. But then we also obviously introduced that there's also a solution that fits the Philips Sonicare. This is then all up to the user to decide whether this is more fitting their needs at this moment or not. Uh, so it's not about pushing devices, but making a meaningful, delivering an end benefit with the right solutions at the right moment. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nicole. Um, another question here, on top of using this service for personalized recommendation, can it also be used as a trusted tool to identify specific and unknown needs ge geographically for Philips? Shall I uh, answer that question? Yes. So, yes, I think it, it could, right? And here again, it's very important that you know, we act within what you can and cannot do with data. Again, we are interested in the person, right? We are there to understand. And yes, we are business, right? So yes, there are questions about how we can best facilitate that. Um, but then we also look into 
what would be the benefits for bigger groups of people, right? What if we could anonymously look at what are patterns across people and what are the care needs that actually might uh, exist in certain areas of the world or certain areas uh, um, in a in a country even or in an area in an in a city? I can you know in the if you um, think about other examples where we look at what you call social determinants of health, it's your social economic context that can heavily influence um, the chances you have on um, developing certain conditions and having more knowledge on that on a uh, population level could be very beneficial to make care accessible to everyone and affordable to everyone so yes this could definitely be a benefit and again i really want to stress that yeah. we always look at that from what is the benefit we can bring to an individual's health or maybe in the future also to community health. And maybe uh, I can add, uh, still that indeed we also saw this during the study that when we actually found out that a trigger works, uh, a new trigger works for one person in the study, we could also apply it to other people. Um, again, with the toothbrush example, we had made this trigger then also available for others if there were no morning brushing sessions detected. To also check if maybe probing on motivation uh, would also work out for them. So this is how we could reuse individual triggers for a larger population. Um, now I do hear you think, and I would like to mention that as well, like, okay, but you were there as research to make the system really personal. How can you make the system really personal if you are not there anymore? And I think uh, I'd like to elaborate a little bit on that with the example of uh, IPL. So one of the ladies when we visited her at home, she mentioned that the most personal thing she found out of the system was the notification to not use her IPL Lumea uh, device, hair removal device today, because the UV light was very um, high outside. She was due to use it. Um, and this, this notification was given because it could, uh, your skin could be sensitive because of sunburn. She thought that was the most personal uh, message for her because it came at the exact right moment when she really had that care need. Uh, so it's a simple trigger. It's a simple rule based trigger, but given at the right moment and given in the right context can be super personalized. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for uh, elaborating on this, Nicole. That's that's really interesting. Um, was there any evidence found on the influence of families and friends on activities of participants? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so actually we have done studies before uh, the study that we now showed where we uh, followed a whole family. Um, and then you do see a lot of interactions between families uh, on, for instance, also brushing behavior, but also sleeping patterns. Um, that's good to take into account. This study focused on one individual um, and, uh, and we have to combine those learnings also going forward to see how can we uh, cater for uh, multiple, multiple stakeholders in mm. one service. Yes. Nice, thanks. Yeah. Nicole, maybe a good follow up with an, uh, with an anecdote on that side because indeed we also looked at families and uh, one of and we were looking also in how to evolve our practice around data and how could we use the data inputs to make design decisions and at first we were looking at uh, toothbrushing uh, routines and we couldn't really find any we were thinking like yeah what is not really interesting about this we were looking at the days and people actually find it quite steady um, way of brushing if you look at them individually but then indeed if you would look at the family and you would compare families you would see that actually families have you know they have a family routine if it comes to brushing and that is actually especially if you have young children you can imagine that is a very interesting thing to use in your system to support and later we also did so so in a later study we really focused on uh, brushing routines with of young children and their parents and we use like a voice assistance to really support this brushing routine and then again these insights that we had from earlier studies about family routines around something as brushing, we can use them to really build meaningful uh, uh, concepts and solutions for, for people. 
So again, that's how you find out what is the meaning of data for the individual, but that certainly also that inspires um, how you would uh, bring value to others. Yeah, and so you can then address the whole system, the whole family in this case. Yes. Nice. The combination of data awareness, push notifications and supplemental information is great for the beginning of the change in behavior, but does it also work uh, on the longer term? That is a question here. Yeah, you want to go yeah. with Nicole? Yeah. Yeah, so indeed we have to change the way we interact over time. So we are also not saying we need to be always present 100% and send you a notification every day. That's also not what we did in the eight weeks that we were there. You have to also be silent and in the background when there is no care need. But it's exactly the point that you identify the new care need that, as I was saying, changes happen all the time to identify that need on time and be there again when it matters. So it's timing is of the essence here. And for that, you need to also silently in the background uh, try to keep an eye on what new needs emerge. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Nicole. Um, you explained in your presentation that you also offered open trackers to people in the study. How did that exactly add value? Yeah, so that is one of the most interesting things, actually. If you give people an open tracker, they have to think themselves also on what is it actually that I want to find out? What is it that I want to know? And as they go through that thinking, they actually uh, tell you a lot on their care needs. So, for instance, families put an open tracker on the cabinet of the of their snacks because they wanted to track what time do I open the cabinet? How often do I open that cabinet or my whole family actually? Um, or they put it on the bathroom just to check how long do I stay in the bathroom uh, and how long does my uh, son or daughter stay in the bathroom? So open trackers give a lot of information on what it is that the family is actually looking for answers for. Nice, so that they could actually really decide themselves where to put those. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think if I can, uh, if I can a little bit elaborate on that, because this is something that we have developed as part of the data enabled design uh, approach over the years, is this we really are interested, as I stated in the beginning, what is the combination of quantitative and qualitative data? So the more objective and the more subjective data, and it's the power of these two together to understand what and why people are doing something. And these open trackers, they are particularly meaningful, although they might come in a quite um, uh, quantitative manner. They might be collective, might be just buttons you click, but the fact that people can do different things with them, they will tell you what is their interest. They are also the things that are more subjective in tracking, right? You, this, if you ask some open questions, right? So someone says like, I will track whenever I get a snack. You could actually pose a question on snacking or some information on snacking at that moment. And you get into these new conversations, not only in a TCY study, but we have seen this in multiple studies to be a very great help in um, when we looked at modern childcare around development of the uh, child, we had seen parents that were very much interested in, um, in the, the, the length of the baby sleeping, but it turned out it was not so interesting. So they started with a more open tracker. They started to indicate how, they, how well they thought the baby slept, which gets into a completely different discussion than focusing on the duration. Um, in uh, the project we talked about this Tuesday around Corker about people that are losing weight, um, we actually saw that people started tracking their boredom uh, or their loneliness, very subjective personal things that are not there to quant that we don't want to quantify, but we used to understand how can we best help or in the more medical context, how can medical professionals be of best help? So again, I think these open trackers, as Nicole already explained, the combination of these two quantitative qualitative that is where you get into very rich conversations um, and actually also put that into a system, a system that can operate that rather than people uh, being behind that. Mm -hmm. super, super cool. Super cool. Uh, Eva, the theme of um, the Dutch Design Week, or at least the Philips part of this, is liberating healthcare. How do you connect this project to that theme? Yeah. So, Healthcare is in big, big transition and or needs a big transition. And I think if something has been obvious from our pandemic that we're still in, 
uh, with all of us over the whole world is that our healthcare systems, they are really under pressure. And access to care is not a given for everyone. And affordable care is even a given for less people in this world. And if we really want to make sure that we are moving to a world in which people do have access and can afford care, it is utmost important that we start bridging the two worlds that are new, now two separate worlds of healthy living and prevention together with our, like say, hardcore healthcare systems. These are new, not two separate things. Mm -hmm. If you brush your teeth in the morning, you're not a different person than when you'd walk into the hospital to check up on your heart. You are one and the same person and we should be treating people like that. And with we, I mean the whole healthcare system, solution providers like Philips, but also healthcare providers as a hospital. And also us ourselves as people, we have to consider how we take charge of our own health. So that's why this is all about liberating healthcare, um, because we are making the step of really at the home, start taking care of yourself and hopefully all take better care of yourself might you get into a care situation or maybe prevent it from happening at all in the future yes it is uh, i think a closing question uh, ladies um it is quite clear that this is a really really interesting uh, project you finalized or not maybe even finalized so the question is how is the result of this study applied in phillips and what would be the next step yeah, so there are, several, there are several projects where we are applying this learnings to. Um, as Eva already mentioned, we are applying this to uh, projects that are uh, looking into the healthcare system. There's also projects in personal health where we're trying to uncover how can we um, continue to apply this method of really understanding people in our current apps and solutions that we have. So it's about uh, actually educating our inside organization also with these learnings and tools and keep uh, applying them in the field further. Wow, looking forward to hearing more. Um, we've come to the end of this uh, inspirational session. Um, Eva and also Nicole, what if people are interested in becoming a colleague in uh, Philips Experience Design, joining one of your teams? Yeah, they uh, they can simply scan the QR code, isn't it, Colette? <laughs> so uh, I'm. Yes, I maybe I can add. Maybe I can add to that. Your team. Sorry. So in the just scan the code and uh, sign up for the talent pool if you are interested in uh, joining Philips Experience Design. And I think uh, Eva, at least your team is uh, is growing. Uh, also this year, so um, yes, jump yeah, in. I could maybe add a little bit to this. Yeah. So um, yeah, we have seen an. Uh, so this is a multidisciplinary team, right? Uh, Nicole, grown up in a product design role and now being a design strategist, leading how do you bring these kind of innovation concepts to uh, together with the business context, and how do we bring this further? Me coming in also from developing a capability like data enabled uh, design. How do you build this? How do you make this a reality? And how do we take a step uh, further? Um, it's multidisciplinary, but data design is a big part of, uh, of concepts that you see here. And yes, we are a growing team moving fast. So uh, keep an eye on, uh, on our uh, vacancies, both in Eindhoven, in Bangalore, and probably also in the US, we will grow. So. Um, also, don't be shy and connect to me on LinkedIn. I will always post the uh, openings I have. Thank you very much. And thank you both again for sharing this amazing work with us. Really well done. And also thanks to all attendees for joining this last session in our uh, online series for the Dutch Design Week. Many thanks for all the great questions and really looking forward to seeing you all again. For now, goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.